Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this Grattan webinar, How to Reignite Policy Reform in Australia. I'm Danielle Wood. I'm CEO of the Grattan Institute. Uh, I'm dialing in today from Boomerang country. Uh, I'd like to pay my respects to the elders of, of that land and also to the lands around the country from which people are joining us today. Uh, I do think it's important to recognise in a webinar on policy reform that, that some of the most pressing policy challenges facing Australia relate to reconciliation with our First Nations peoples and closing the gaps in their health, education, economic outcomes and wellbeing. Uh, but today we are here to talk about reform in the broad. Uh, the topic of reform and why don't we do enough of it is probably a familiar refrain from anyone that's attended a policy forum or read an AFR opinion piece any time in the past 20 years. But what does it actually mean? Um, is it true we're doing less of it? And if so, what are the blockages? Um, so today I really want to get behind the hand-waving and talk to three people who are deep experts, having spent more time directly observing and thinking about these issues than probably almost anyone else in Australia. Um, so top left of your screen today is Dr Martin Parkinson. Martin has served in Commonwealth government leadership positions in all facets of economic, social, foreign, defence and national security policies for almost 40 years. He was Secretary of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet between 2016 and 2019, Secretary of the Treasury between 2011 and 2014, and he was also Australia's inaugural Secretary of Department of Climate Change. During his tenure, Martin led uh, key public service organisations um, through a period of considerable political uncertainty, which is probably putting it mildly, serving under five prime ministers. Dr Don Russell um, is next there over on your right. Don has extensive experience in both the public and private sectors and brings a unique perspective on policy formulation and the political process. He served as Australia's ambassador to the United States during the Clinton years and was principal advisor to Paul Keating during his time as treasurer and prime minister. Until 2018, Don was the Chief Executive of the South Australian Department of Premier and Cabinet, and his previous roles include Secretary of the Commonwealth Department of Industry, Innovation, Climate Change, Science, Research and Tertiary Education. <laughs> so, nice long one to say fast. Uh, he's currently the Independent Chair of Australian Super, Australia's largest superannuation fund. Uh, and finally, at uh, bottom of the screen, um, Grattan's former CEO, my long-term colleague, um, Dr. John Daly. Uh, John is one of Australia's leading policy thinkers. He led the Grattan Institute for its first 11 years, publishing leading reports on government priorities, tax reform, retirement incomes and housing affordability. He continues to consult and publish on public policy issues and has more than 30 years experience spanning the academic world, government and corporate roles. Um, in addition to their um, fantastic careers as leading policy thinkers, uh, our panel today also have something else in common um, in that they have all either recently published or soon to publish pieces reflecting on the policy making process in Australia. Um, so I'll start with Martin and Don. Um, they have both published very thoughtful, uh, very readable contributions as part of Monash University Press's, Monash University Publishing, I should say, sorry, excellent national interest series. Um, the series certainly resonated with me because that's certainly the lens we bring to thinking about things uh, at Grattan as well. Um, so I'm really excited that they're here to talk about their books. Um, Martin, do you want to kick us off? Um, yours, A Decade of Drift. Can you tell us a little bit about the drift that you, you were talking about in this book uh, and what do you think has contributed to that drift? Yeah, thanks, Danny. Um, the book's predominantly about Australia's failure to craft a sustainable approach to, um, uh, to climate policy. Uh, but the root causes behind that um, go to why we've also been unable to tackle big issues like the structural decline in our productivity performance, which is, um, you know, has been one of the determinants of weak living standard growth over the last decade and, uh, uh, and is a key challenge for us um, as, we, uh, as we look forward. Um, now, both uh, of these uh, issues, climate change and the inability to tackle um, productivity, carry big risks. Uh, clearly, in the case of climate change, huge risks in terms of human health um, uh, and, uh, indeed, human life. Uh, but also risks around stranding assets uh, to livestock, to the environment. In the case of both of them, though productivity as well, it's also risks to wealth, to job opportunities uh, and to, um, to future living standards. 
uh, and hence to the sort of standard of living of our people as we go forward. Uh, and the reason why I, um, why I put the two together is because um, the interesting thing here is these are two areas where we failed to grasp the nettle and take on um, these over the last decade. And it's not like we haven't known about them. Uh, we've been talking about the productivity decline for um, or productivity deterioration and the implications for living standards for um, well over a decade. Uh, we've been talking about the challenges of climate change since 1994. Uh, so it's not like this is this is new. And it's interesting because um, even though we failed there, we've the really interesting issue is I think was we've had quite a few policy successes in other areas. So what is it about those policy successes in other areas vis-a-vis -vis, um, these two? And the, the other angle on it is as we try to rebuild better um, as we come out of COVID, are there issues here that we need to be conscious of that will inhibit our ability to have a sustained and sustainable um, recovery? Now, uh, Don's book um, goes into this in detail, but I think the approach to leadership that we've seen from our political class is um, is critical to this. And, and uh, I'll leave Don to explore this in more detail, but just a couple of things. The unwillingness to level with the community about the complexity of the problems that we've got. Um, the unwillingness to take on the risk of political failure, um, to be transparent and to put the national interest before short-term political gain all feed into this. Now, that's exacerbated by um, technological changes uh, such as the emergence of social media, which allows you know, people to, to talk to one another in their own echo chamber rather than hearing a disparate set of perspectives. But a key issue is um, that we've seen uh, the inability to understand on the part of our political class that good policy equals good politics. It's almost as though these two things are seen as um, antithetical. And I think that's contributed to one of the other things that I touch on in, in, the, uh, in the book, which is the decline of trust. Um, now, there's been a decline in trust in all Australian institutions, but um, it is particularly marked in the case of government, where um, the community trusts neither um, government's beneficent intent, that is the that government actually has their interests at heart um, and they don't trust its competence. Uh, and, uh, you know, that actually is a really big inhibitor for us tackling these bigger challenges and taking on some of the issues that we need to address in a post-COVID world. Fantastic. Well, a, a lot of big themes there, Martin, and we'll, we'll come back to some of them. Um, you know, the trust point is interesting. The, the, the one kind of bright spot there, I think, was the, the bounce back in trust, um, particularly during the early, the early stages of COVID. And it does suggest that um, when governments are being competent and, and working together, that um, that trust can be restored. Um, nice segue into to Don's um, essay on leadership. Um, you know, it's a really interesting take, I think, on um, how political leadership and how that relationship between political leaders and the public service has changed over time. Um, Don, can you talk us through that central theme in the book uh, and, and why you argue it's made policy change in the nas national interest more difficult? Unmute. Yeah, no, well, well thanks, Danny. Um, uh, look, the, 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 there are a lot of factors involved in, um, you know, how nations uh, come to grips with policy challenges and, and deliver on it, but... The um, the what, what I um, I guess one of the, the themes or one of the, the things I focused on in the book was um, you know what actually motivates um, politicians, ministers, prime ministers, and premiers. We tend not to um, they're central players, but we tend not to think so much about um, you know what it is which actually drives them. And I suppose I felt that, um, in fact, this was the reason I wrote the book in the end was because I was convinced that I probably did bring a sort of unusual set of experiences having uh, 
had that uh, period with the, the Hawke Keating years, but then more recently from uh, 2011 to 2018, when, uh, as you said, I headed up a very large uh, Commonwealth Government Department, and then I headed up a similar department in South Australia, ending up as the um, head of Premier and Cabinet. So in that time, in between 2011 and 2018, I, um, you know, I was answerable, worked with 21 ministers and their offices, in, you know, including premiers and prime ministers' offices. So um, I've sort of ended up with, um, you know, quite a uh, an unusual, I guess, um, set of experiences working, you know, quite closely, working closely with uh, ministers and their staff. And uh, you can't help but um, come away with, uh, you know, a very strong feeling that they all lead an awful life. Uh, they're they're in the conflict business. Conflict is their, you know, daily experience. But it's not just conflict. Um, it's betrayal, um, often their colleagues. Uh, it's a, it is a very difficult environment for people to go about their daily life. And uh, it takes its toll. It, um, uh, it leaves scars, um, particularly for, you know, senior, senior um, ministers and senior figures. And uh, I do make the point in the book that, um, you know, they may look like you and I, but in fact, they're not. Um, and uh, I come back to this because it's um, it is actually quite important. But they all, uh, one way or another, carry with them notions about what makes for electoral success. And uh, and as I identify in the book, um, I have over the years sort of um, divided um, political leaders, political figures into um, pleasers and doers, and uh, the pleasers. Uh, believe that, look, if you're nice to the electorate, the electorate will be nice to you. And what leads them into, um, you know, a way of operating is polling. Um, they feel that uh, polling gives them that extra edge in, in being able to, I guess, more effectively please the electorate if they have some idea what it is they want. Um, this is essentially translational politics. If you can only work out what it is people will want, then we can deliver it for them and they will be satisfied and will get re-elected. The doers have a more cynical attitude. They um, believe that the electorate is instinctively um, cynical about them. Um, they um, have doubts about their motives. Um, they, um, in a sense, tolerate political leaders, but they do value um, political figures, leaders, ministers who appear to be useful, <laughs> who identify problems uh, and then attempt to deal with them. So my observation, I guess, over this entire period and coming back into in a public policy in 2011 was that, um, you know, as politics has become more unstable, as the electorate has become more fickle, I guess, uh, the pleasers um, have essentially gain the upper hand. And this means that overall, there's less interest in problem solving and much more interest in the polling, a desperate attempt to try and find, look for advantage in the polling. But um, having said all of that, uh, my book is in essentially a hopeful book because uh, as I observed, the current practice of politics leads to bad outcomes for the nation. But it also leads to bad outcomes for the, for the politicians themselves, for ministers. It leads to short careers and very unsatisfactory careers. So the book is really um, an appeal to um, self-interest in the sense that uh, the world does belong to um, problem solvers. Um, pleasers will eventually be seen to be ineffectual and deceptive. Uh, and so the book holds out the prospect that, um, you know, with a change of behavior, um, we can um, we can deliver better outcomes for the nation, but we can deliver better outcomes uh, for ministers and political figures in terms of length of, of their careers and the satisfaction that comes from actually doing things and being uh, acknowledged for that. So, um, so I guess it's an ambitious um, project I've embarked on. That's to change the way politics is practiced in this country, but. Um, you just sort of feel that there has to be a better way for everyone. So I think, I think a bit of ambition is called for right now. So I think it was a fantastic contribution.
Um, and, and finally, to John, um, we don't have a shiny report to hold up quite yet, um, but can you tell us a little bit about the report you have been working on for Grattan about roadblocks to policy reform? Uh, it will be out early July. Um, are you finding or, or does your analysis kind of line up with, with Martin and Don's contention that the pace of reform has slowed? Uh, and can you tell us a little bit about the approach that you're actually using to try and understand the obstacles to reform? Thank you. Um, well, of course, one's always nervous when um, people who have been in office tell you that it was, you know, fantastic when they were running the show, but now it's not nearly as good. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's certainly true that many of the people in Australia who are the leading people saying, you know, it used to be fabulous and now it's not nearly so good are people who are involved, and that's probably not surprising. So one of the things we do to start with is to ask, well, is that really true? What's the evidence? Um, and I think it probably is true. Um, so one thing you can do in a really crude way is just list out all of the reforms that happened, you know, particularly through the Hawke-Keating era uh, and the first two terms of the Howard government. And it is indeed a pretty impressive list. Um, both on an economic side and on a social side in terms of economic and social reform. And if you look at the list over the last 10 years, it's fair to say it's a lot shorter. Um, so, uh, you know, just when you look at the scope of the number of things and the scale of the things that went through in the 90s, you know, everything from floating the dollar, a very substantial industrial relations reform, um, a very substantial tariff reforms, uh, privatisation of major sectors of the economy, everything from banking to airlines to telecommunications to energy uh, to um, water. Um, you know, this is a this is a, an era in which it really is true that a lot happened. And you look at what has happened in the last 10 years, and with respect, it's, you know, it's a much shorter list. And, and also, there is much more of a phenomenon of reforms being put in place and then, uh, or at least put up and then being unwound. So you have the Howard Workplace uh, Work Choices reforms that were unwound. Obviously, you have carbon pricing, which was, you know, in place uh, and was then um, unwound. You have the Abbott government um, attempting to um, reform um, age of access to the age pension, which they ultimately took off the table. Um, you know, it's a series of things that were put on the table um, and then got taken off again. Uh, so just at that crude level, I think we can say that the pace of reform has slowed down. Now, the catch is you're always nervous that when you're doing that, you're, you're thinking about life selectively. Uh, and so we tried to do it a bit more objectively by looking at the um, OECD's um, country reports. Um, so the OECD produces a report on its member countries about each of its member countries about once every 18 months saying, you know, here's all the things that we think ought to happen differently in, say, France, but obviously they also do one for Australia. Uh, and they go all the way back to about 1973. Um, they put one out you know, roughly every 18 months. Uh, and what we did was track essentially the major recommendations of those reforms and whether or not that had happened. Uh, and when you do it in that way, of course, by definition, you're looking at reforms which are proposed in advance. The reality of how those reports are put together is that um, the views that are expressed in the report are usually not a million miles away from what our public servants really think um, uh, and not necessarily what they will say in public. Uh, but what we found was that uh, it really is true that the hit rate on those reforms proposed by the OECD has fallen. Um, now, it's also true that the OECD has started to propose more in the way of social reforms than it used to. It used to be very focused on an economic agenda, um, now includes more of a social agenda. But whether you're looking at the social agenda or the economic agenda, either way, you can see this substantial slowdown in the hit rate, more reforms that get um, explicitly rejected by governments, more reforms that just kind of sit on the slate and make no progress. So it certainly looks as though things are happening less quickly. Um, in terms of um, trying to understand why this might be the case, um, I, I guess what, we've, what we're doing is we're taking all of the re major reforms the Grattan Institute has proposed, um, uh, partly because that means by definition we've already done the work explaining why we think they're a good idea and you may or may not disagree uh, agree with us, but hopefully uh, most people think that Grattan is batting at least above average uh, and consequently more often than not we're right that those are worthwhile reforms and then telling the story just looking at the history, um, have they happened or not? Uh, and if they didn't happen, 
you know, what are the things that are standing in the way? And then when we aggregate up that story of well over 70 reforms that we've identified, um, uh, what does that tell us about our institutions? Because of course, one of the problems here is if we just sort of say, well, it's about leadership and if only we had great leaders like the past, you get suck it into that kind of great person theory of history um, and it doesn't help very much, sort of just wishing you had better leaders. Uh, so this is trying to look at the structural things. What makes it more likely that we will have leadership that leads to um, more worthwhile reform happening. Fantastic. Thank you, John. Um, I should have said at the start, um, please feel free to pop your questions into the, the Q&A box there. Uh, we had a number of really great questions um, submitted in advance of the seminar, and I'll, I will put some of those to the panel as we go through, uh, but I'll also come to those, those live questions as they're there. Um, so all of you have touched on this in some way or another, but the the idea of, you know, there was a sort of golden era of reform, um, you know, the Hawke Keating early Howard years. Um, Don and Martin, you were both there on the ground. Um, and you both talk in your books a little bit about what you think were those sort of crucial ingredients of success in those years. Uh, I, I'm interested, can you tell the audience what, what you see those ingredients as being and do you actually think they could be replicated again today? Um, Martin, should we start with you? Yeah, um, thanks, Tony. Um, so uh, I don't subscribe to the great leaders um, theory of uh, reform um, because great leaders don't exist in isolation. It's contextualised. Um, so if you think about uh, the early 80s, what was the context? We had gone through a decade bookended by two recessions. And that decade was characterised by stagflation. So very stagnant growth, very high inflation. Um, we had unprecedented uh, levels of unemployment. We had unprecedented levels of inflation. We had uh, Lee Kuan Yew and others um, in saying that we we're on the way to being the poor white trash of Asia. Uh, and um, you had, as you know, Paul Kelly spelt this out in, in um, oh God, years ago, and where he said there was widespread recognition that the status quo um, had failed because of that context, and that's in the community. It's not just amongst the policymakers, but the broader community had a sense that we couldn't go on the way we were. There was a consensus in the political system uh, and amongst economists of um, uh, ideas around the use of markets, um, need to deregulate, wind back protection, uh, and so on, and imposing more discipline on the public sector. And there was a political culture, and this comes to the, the great person bit, but the political culture can't be divorced from that context, but a political culture that was able to prioritise the, the national interest. Um, I think the overlay on that uh, is that, um, well, first of all, I'd say that consensus point is critical because we don't have that now, the fragmentation of our community and loss of social cohesion um, and this absence of a sense of a burning platform is quite critical. But I think the other things, though, that were important were um, whether you're talking about Hawke and Keating or whether you're talking about Howard and the Drys, they had a vision of where they wanted to go and they had the ability to communicate it in a compelling way. Now, by that, I don't mean that they could stand up and articulate a fully fleshed out vision. Ex post, it looks like we knew what we were doing in the 1980s. But in actual fact, a lot of the things that we did forced us or created the opportunities for us to do the subsequent things. It wasn't like we had a playbook that said, we're going to do this, then we're going to do that, and then we're going to do this. Um, uh, but what we were able to have were leaders um, who were able to articulate where they wanted to go and to explain why. Um, we had an openness about with the public about what that would involve um, and a recognition there would be losers, but also an acknowledgement that would be trying to make their impact on them less than would, that it could be. Um, there was a focus. 
uh, you know, as Don notes in his book, and I, I've talked about elsewhere, I've characterized the difference between um, Kevin Rudd's approach to climate change and Paul Keating's approach to almost any reform issue. Keating would have cleared the decks. Every single minister would have talked about the one thing and only the one thing. He and Hawke would have been out there leading it. The others would have played a subordinate role and they would have been on message and they would have built the argument and they would have communicated it consistently. I think the contrast to Kevin Rudd, it was like, um, uh, and I'm not being critical of Kevin, but the government approach was he was trying to do too many things at once and so it was like a lighthouse. The lighthouse would light on your issue and it would get immense attention for a short period of time, but then it would immediately jump to health reform or education reform or whatever. And the public was hearing multiple different messages uh, and that made it uh, a lot harder. Um, can it be replicated? Uh, I, I think the change media landscape makes it much harder. Um, if you think back to that period, uh, we were able to have sensible discussions with leading um, political and economic commentators. Uh, they were able to um, spend time themselves acting as a bridge to explain to the public about what was being done and why. And importantly, there was that consensus around um, the sorts of things that should be prioritised. Uh, I think the other thing is um, the politicians' training and experience set today is much narrower, and, and I'm happy to sort of spell that out. I can either do it now or later. Um, I think the new Parliament House structure, uh, weirdly, uh, and you might think this is a crazy point, but I think it contributes to, to tribalism. Old Parliament House forced people to rub shoulders against with one another. Um, they had built personal relationships that carried into the new Parliament House. People who have come into politics through this narrower training program and then go into a more tribal environment in the building don't have that same capacity or perhaps even recognition of the importance of building um, links across the um, uh, the, the corridor. Uh, but I don't think politicians today are innately incapable. They just don't prioritise these things. And, and um, a key issue here is that neither side prioritises the economy as, um, as, an, as an issue. Uh, I did a... Um, uh, I did an event a few... Oh, two months ago where I said, look, um, put your hand up if you, this was to a group of business people, put your hand up if you can think of um, somebody who's one of the leaders of uh, the Labor Party left um, and what they stand for. Almost everybody in the room put their hand up. I said, put your hand up if you can think of a leader of the Labor Party right who is trying to change the party's position vis-a-vis -vis coal. Everybody put their hand up said, um, put your hand up if you can think of a uh, Liberal um, parliamentarian who you would regard as a leader of the, um, the socially conservative um, side of the party. Everybody put their hand up. I said, put your hand up if you can think of somebody who is the leader of the economic drives or economic rationalists in the Liberal Party. Not one person in that room, and there are about 40-odd business people put their hand up. So I think a really important thing to recognise is, and this goes to context, I'm not being critical of, of the coalition vis-a-vis -vis Labor, but the context that I talked about before of starting the 1980s um, after a decade of stagnation bookended by two recessions really made economic reform issues the absolute priority. Today there's no sense of that burning platform. I think the other thing that, that was important there um, during the Hawke-Keating era was that the Liberal Party basically, uh, or the coalition, basically attacked them on the, the pace, not on the direction of reform, which actually allowed them um, to have greater freedom of movement uh, and in a way it was actually made it easier 
for uh, for Hawke and Keating to deliver on that um, consensus set of priorities. Um, having said that, I don't think the current politicians are innately uh, less capable. Um, that training experience set uh, really is an inhibitor, and I think it's worth unpacking that later. Um, I'd have to say the experience to date, though, is not promising about replicating uh, the reform. Um, there were two tests, in my mind, for government in the way it supported the economy during the, the COVID crisis. The first was to ensure that we got through the crisis with um, as little damage as possible to, uh, e to employment relationships and to sustain economic activity. Undoubtedly, they've done that and they deserve the big tick. But in the process, they spent 15% of GDP. And the second test that I laid out in, in the book was that um, would they have done things that have set us up for the future, either to be more internationally competitive, to deal with some of the big problems like, um, like climate change, or to deal with some of our big social problems. And uh, my position is they have um, arguably failed that second test. Uh, so, yeah, I think Thank I'll you. probably leave yeah. it. <laughs> A lot of big themes there. You know, inter very interesting on that sort of second test and what time frame we might expect them to deliver that in. I, I'm probably a little bit uh, more forgiving given um, the, the amount of work that's been done sort of coming out of the crisis. Um, I, I want to come back to a couple of the themes that Martin touched on there. And John, I'll, I'll come back to you in a minute on that idea of kind of a shared vision, because that's coming through a bit in the questions. But um, Don, first to you, I mean, that was a very comprehensive answer by Martin, but is there anything that particularly resonated with you or that you thought was, was missed in that idea of the, the golden age and what we can replicate now? Uh, I'll look, um, just one observation. I was very conscious that I didn't write a book about, uh, which really had a theme, which was there was a time when giants strode the, the stage and now we're left with pygmies. Uh, in fact, I quite consciously um, say in the book that, um, you know, and this is based on my experience with, um, recent experience with the ministers and all, is that uh, there are good people there. There are people there who are quite determined to make a difference and do things. The problem is, and this I think is really at the heart of our issue, the problem is that they're caught up in a, in a practice which makes it extraordinarily difficult for them to um, deliver on what they actually want to do. Um, you know, I was thinking about it in my time. I can't remember, this is my recent time, I can't remember a minister who you know, had a clear idea about a problem, what should be done, um, arguing against the polling. What would normally happen is the minister would put forward the case and back would come the very sort of brief and abrupt um, comment, it's not supported by the polling. And that, by and large, was the end of the story. Now, what um, what I would say about, um, you know, again, that notion that in the in the golden years, everything was great, um, people may have noticed John Hyde's comment um, in the Financial Review the other day uh, when he drew attention to what he called the, the timid and weak Fraser government. Um, that was a, a government at one stage uh, had majorities in both the House and the Senate, but the criticism of Fraser, and it went on for another decade or so, and it was the driving force between um, Howard and Peacock, was that he had squandered this opportunity to do things. And so my point would be is that it really is at its heart about how politics is practised. And what was different about the Hawke-Keating period, um, there were problems, that's true. There was a burning um, deck, that's true. There was a lot of um, informed analysis which was available to people. But what was different was the two of them, their starting point was they wanted to control the debate. Um, their approach was, this is what we are going to talk about, not what would you like to talk about. And the consequences of that was that because they controlled the agenda and because they were willing not only just to identify the problem, but to outline what it was that had to be done to, um, to deal with the problem, 
they controlled the political debate and the agenda, and they actually dragged the opposition in behind them. They had no choice, really, having won um, the argument in that. And that is what is missing today, is that, um, unfortunately, the people who um, you know, run political strategy are wedded to the notion that it is best not to stray too far from what is supported in the polling. And there is almost uh, a reluctance to accept the notion that by the behaviour of um, political leadership, you can actually change the way in which people view the issue and the year can actually change the polling. So, um, so I would come back uh, more to the notion that it's uh, an approach to politics, um, which um, some um, politicians and leaders have been able to put into practice but at the moment, we're caught up in, a, in an approach and a philosophy which makes it very difficult. And that's not to say that the existing um, crop of ministers aren't, in ca aren't, aren't can't, capable of actually doing it. They just aren't in a position to do it. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a really great point. Um, a related point, and it does also come back to something that, that Martin said, John, there's a, there's a question from Daniel Petrie, but a few in this vein. Um, about the the kind of the lack of a singular vision. Um, so he said, to what extent is reform a casualty of the culture wars, competing visions of what Australia should be with somewhat polarised views between different political tribes? Um, sorry, the questions love, always like to move just as I'm reading them out. Um, to what extent is the true solution partly in the shared vision and identity space, which seems to have been the Hawke Keating superpower? So I think that's, part of what's going on. So, I mean, I think that this thing about public opinion is a really big deal. And certainly coming through the Grattan case studies, we haven't found a single example of something that's been implemented that was unpopular. Uh, and then there's, on the other hand, the hit rate of things that are popular is not too bad. And if you think about that, contrast it to the golden years, um, you know, a lot of what was done at the, was unpopular at the time and indeed is still unpopular. So, you know, privatisation, you know, you are struggling to find um, majority support for that even today. Um, a lot of the tariff reforms were definitely unpopular at the time and many of them probably still unpopular today. So that is a big change. And I think understanding what has changed about our institutions that mean that politicians are not prepared to go after unpopular things is an important part of the puzzle. But I think the other big part of the puzzle um, is this thing around, well, it, it's partly around culture wars, but I think it's partly about what um, uh, Martin described as tribalism. Because I think one of the really interesting things, if you take the, the kind of core case study, um, or case study that's core to Martin's book, which is around climate change, um, and you, you put it against those things that um, Paul Kelly um, identifies as being the kind of secrets to success in the Hawke Keating era, you know, did we recognise the problem? Well, certainly going back to sort of 2008, 9, 10, 11, 12, I mean, heaven knows, everybody understood that climate change was a problem. Uh, and even John Howard, perhaps somewhat reluctantly, but essentially got on board and said, yes, there's a problem. Um, there was a consensus across the political and policy class. You know, it, you, you would have struggled to find a lot of economists saying that pricing carbon was a bad idea. Uh, and certainly at the point that Howard went to the election um, in 2007, you know, that we essentially had a consensus across our political class that doing something about climate change, something relatively serious, was necessary. Political culture, maybe not, and we'll come to that in just a moment. So then when you ask, so why did all of that fall apart? And I think one of the things that happened was that um, a part of our politics, to be blunt, the conservative right, made it a marker of being membership of the tribe that you didn't believe in climate change and you certainly didn't believe in government doing anything about it. Um, and when, when you identify your membership of a tribe by a belief, um, then, of course, it becomes very difficult to do anything that runs contrary to that belief, because as soon as you do, you're essentially marking yourself out as not being a member of the tribe. And in a world in which our politics has, if anything, become much more about patronage than it used to be, the one thing you cannot afford to do is to in any way indicate that you're not a member of the tribe. So because our politics has become more tribal and because a lot of the time membership of the tribes is defined by a series of beliefs, many of which are not actually, well, 
many of which are not um, reconcilable, i.e. they're mutually contradictory. Um, many of them are, um, uh, shall we say, not obviously fact-based. Indeed, if you think about it, if you want a belief to mark you out as a member of the tribe, actually it's more effective at marking you out as a member of the tribe if it's an irrational thing to believe. Because sensible people will otherwise appear to be members of the tribe because they believe in it because it's sensible. Um, uh, and it's not. this is not just a right-wing phenomenon. If you look at the ALP's attitude to superannuation, all superannuation is good. Thou shalt not ever criticise any part of the system. Um, you know, partly that's about, you know, this was our reform back in the Hawke Keating era and we want to kind of say our legacy was wonderful, but part of it has become essentially a political belief um, and it marks out membership of the tribe. And I think that's one of the things that happened to climate change was because it became tied up as a tribal marker, it's become really hard to make progress. And so I think that is something that is making it much harder to make progress. And of course, the culture wars are part of that um, on both sides, you know, essentially relatively extreme points of view that um, you have to hold if you want to remain a member of the tribe. And in particular, if you want to remain a member of a particular part of politics. So it's not even just a particular party, but usually a particular part of a party. And if you don't hold those particular beliefs, um, you essentially cease to be a member of the tribe and therefore, of course, cease to qualify for all of the benefits that come from being membership of the tribe, which start with being able to become a political staffer, go on to the ability to get pre-selected and then go on to the ability to get, frankly, a whole bunch of nice jobs afterwards. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, John. And that's, it's, it's a good place to finish because we are getting um, quite a number of questions about political staffers and um, how those roles have changed over time. So thanks, Michael Mintrom, Sarah Nixon, um, two people who I know are very interested in, in this space. Um, Don, your um, essay touches on this and particularly the um, not just the kind of number of political staffers, but that their background and how that's changed over time and how that feeds into policymakers, um, policymaking. Can you talk a little bit about that? And then, um, Martin, I'm really keen to talk more about the role of the, the public service after that. Uh, well, Australia has quite an unusual um, structure around ministers in that um, we have uh, a standalone um, um, cadre of they're not public servants, they're employed under MOPs. Um, and that was a conscious decision um, from the early Hawk years. It was um, John Dawkins who actually um, shepherded the legislation through. And it was a deliberate um, um, decision on the part of Hawke and Keating, but mainly Hawke and Dawkins, in that um, ministers needed to be uh, in a position where they could have um, their own sources of um, advice. Um, this was uh, coming out of uh, an experience where ministers, and this was a bipartisan um, position, ministers did not want to ever be in a position where they were dictated to by um, you know, senior figures in the public service. They needed to be able to have a capability to craft and, and design policy responses um, that suited their interests, priorities and needs. And so we ended up with a very powerful um, set of ministerial staff. Uh, and because it was designed originally to, um, to provide equipped ministers with a capability to design new and imaginative poly policy responses independently or working with the public service, um, it provided for consultants, uh, and it provided for um, public servants themselves. So Australia is unusual that a public servant can move across um, into a minister's <laughs> office and be employed under MOPS and cease being a public servant for that time being and therefore engage um, you know, fully as a trusted uh, participant in, uh, in the minister's office. This is unusual. What And this was part of the... Um, of the success of the Hawke Keating years was that they had in their offices, on many cases, the office was headed up by a, by a senior bureaucrat, um, obviously loyal to the minister or to Hawke or Keating, but capable of working successfully with the bureaucracy and getting the best out of the bureaucracy, but also being able to you know, bring the disciplines that come from having uh, 
ministers surrounded by people who understand about public sector probity. So this worked extremely well for um, Hawke and Keating. It helped them uh, not only design uh, and implement a whole range of you know, challenging and important policy changes, but it equipped ministers because the, uh, the staff are answerable only to the minister. The minister employs the staff. They're there at the pleasure of the minister. But as the interest in policy has changed over the years, ministers no longer really see um, senior bureaucrats as a, um, as a sensible way of staffing their offices. It's become um, caught up with all sorts of other things. Um, who knows? Um, just looking at the, the current crop of ministerial staff, it's pretty clear that uh, you know, quite a strange group of people end up in ministers' offices now. But what's happened is that we're left with this very powerful group of ministerial staff that owes its origin back to the hawke years where they were designed for a purpose. They're no longer fit for the purpose that they're being used. So they've, in a sense, become you know, something of a menace in terms of how public policy is organised at the moment. Thanks, Don. Um, Martin, um, John Thompson said, um, why, why are we focused so much on the politicians? Where has the influence and strength of the public service gone over the past 20 years? Any reflections on that? Yeah, um, look, just on the issue of, um, of staffers, I, I think the very best um, staffers are really good. Um, and they really do help uh, government run better. But the very best ministers and the very best staffers understand a very clear distinction between the APS and ministers, and they understand that um, staffers have no power in their own right. Um, they are simply exercising delegated power on the part of the minister. Um, so the best operations see... The APS is a partner, and the worst see it as an enemy. Um, and there has been um, a bit of a, uh, I think this emerged at the end of the Howard years, and you can see elements of it um, today, uh, of we'll do the thinking, you'll do the doing. That is, the public service is nothing more than an implementation tool. Um, and yet that is not at all uh, what the um, Westminster tradition was about. Um, Northcote Trevelyan basically wanted a, um, uh, a, a non-partisan but politically um, influential uh, professional public service that was going to be there to serve uh, the people. Now, the way they did that, and this was has always been the ethos of the Australian public service, is that you serve the people of Australia through the government of the day. Now, what that means is that you need to have the capability set to be thinking about the big issues, to have your own views about what might need to be done, to understand where the government is coming from, what its objectives are, what its priorities are, to actually be willing to engage openly with them about will your approach achieve this outcome? Um, we, so first question, is this the right outcome you should be pursuing, Minister? Here are some pros and cons. Second, um, so we're agreed on the outcome um, or the objective. Uh, will your approach achieve this? There are different ways to get there. These are the pros and cons of the different approaches. And then when the government makes a decision, you go about as long as it's a legal legally appropriate decision, you go about implementing it. Um, I think, you know, uh, the very best people in the public service still have that same ethos. Uh, but I do think it's true that if you look across the public service, some parts of the service have seen a, an erosion in their capabilities. Um, more importantly, though, I think the skill sets that are needed going forward um, differ from those that we've required in the past, e.g. digitisation, data analytics, just to name a few, and the public service uh, as a whole has not been very proactive about building the capabilities for the future. Um, and that's what led 
uh, Malcolm Turnbull and I to the decision that we needed to kick off what was the 30 review. Um, but as you know, as Don points out in his book, the key recommendations of 30 review have either been ignored and said, well, these are matters for the public service leadership, or they've been rejected. Um, so I do think uh, a lot of this is in the hands of the public service leadership. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and I know there's work going on to try and strengthen this, but there are other things which mean, which basically come down to a recognition on the part of government that the public service has to serve them today, but the Prime Minister might be different tomorrow or the government might be different tomorrow, and the public service has to be in a position to be able to serve that group of people as well. And the temptation is to say, I want you to do only with my priorities and only with the things that are important today. And leaders have to be prepared to push back and they have to be prepared to create space for that thinking to deal with the problems that Australia faces, irrespective of who's in government tomorrow. I think the policy is sitting there in the top drawer, the famous. Um, I mean, so obviously the public service is um, the, the most important group for, for building that evidence base for reform that, that the leaders then draw on. But, John, um, you know, outside groups also play a role in, in both putting reforms on the agenda and, and help building their evidence base. Um, you know, how have you seen that shift over time and, and what does what does your work suggest about how important having a, a strong evidence base is to the success or otherwise of reforms on the agenda? Well, if I start with that, that latter question, I mean, the short answer is that evidence makes more difference than I expected, which is kind of, you know, happy news for somebody who used to run a think tank. Um, uh, it's really quite striking how, how much greater the hit rate is for things where the evidence base is stronger. And, and for the purpose of the analysis, we haven't counted um, Grattan's reports as being evidence because by definition, everything we're looking at has got a Grattan report. So we've looked at what's all of the evidence other than whatever Grattan has done. And it's quite noticeable that um, the, the stronger the evidence base, the more likely it is that reform will happen. Uh, and that's um, particularly true if reform is opposed by you know, strong vested interest groups. Um, uh, you know, they turn out to be less powerful than you might think provided that the evidence base is strong. So it definitely matters. Um, in terms of, of who contributes to that evidence base, I, I think one of the little problems here is that we got to this position of saying that the, the only job of the public service is to serve the government of the day. And as Martin points out, actually, it's more complicated than that. And certainly one of the things that's noticeable if you go back 20 years ago is that the public service routinely put stuff out in public that was... Um, quite possibly not government policy and indeed possibly contrary to government policy. So there's a really interesting little vignette of, of Treasury putting something out. And, you know, up until very recently, Treasury had a, you know, an ongoing series of policy papers, which were fascinating reading. Unfortunately, it's been shut down, but, um, you know, it was, uh, wasn't always particularly obviously government policy. Going back, as I said, to the Keating era, there's this lovely vignette of Treasury putting something out and, uh, you know, I gather it was something relatively unpopular at the time and Paul Keating being asked about it. And he said, well, but of course, that's Treasury's view. That's not the government's view. Now, I cannot think of any minister saying, well, but that's the department's view, not my view in the last 10 years, because it simply hasn't happened. Nothing goes out from the public service unless in public, unless it is the minister's view. Um, uh, and so, again, you go back 20 years ago and there were lots of public service submissions to parliamentary inquiries that, you know, you just pick it up and read it. It was pretty obviously not really the view of the minister of the day. It was the view of the senior public servants. And that really contributed to the evidence base because it meant you had this informed public discussion that if the only advice you've got is behind you know, ministerial doors, it just doesn't contribute in the same way. So you've got that has stopped happening. We used to have a lot more um, bodies that were technically part of the public service, but were more removed from government. So things like the Productivity Commission, who's very explicitly have a job to say things that may or may not be government policy. Now, today we've got the Productivity Commission, we've got the Reserve Bank, and then the list is pretty short. And we used to have more of those kind of bodies that were expressly set up at least in part, to say things that the government of the day might well not agree with. And I think a lot of the ones that we do have are now much more careful 
not to contradict the views that their minister might have and to get sign off from the ministerial offices and so on. So that's the kind of bad news. And then on top of that, you've got um, an increasing outsourcing of policy to, to consultants um, and however much capability they might have, inevitably consultants are going to be worried about providing advice that the minister doesn't like because it may well mean that they don't get the next job. Um, and that's a real issue. Um, of course, the one bright spot, and I would say this, wouldn't I, is think tanks. And there's no question that that think tanks in Australia are much more prominent today than they were 20 years ago. Um, there's simply more of them. Um, they employ substantially more people uh, and they have a much louder view in a louder voice in public debate. And I think one of the major reasons for that is essentially the absence of everything else. Um, uh, so that is the counterbalance. There's no question. I think the think tanks do contribute to that public debate. On the other hand, um, if we could have more of that contribution from the public service itself, from these quasi public agencies, um, I think that that would be a good thing. And the history, at least of the last 11 years, suggests very strongly that the more you have, um, the, the more difference it makes. There's a lovely little vignette we've got in the report. Um, uh, two states, particularly Queensland and Victoria, did a lot of work, deep dive work on residential tenancy reform. You know, should you be allowed to have a pet and should you be allowed to hang pictures on the walls? And interestingly, those are the states that moved uh, mm. and reformed. And the states that didn't do that work, at least so far, haven't really reformed. And I think the, the kind of reason that this happens is when there's no evidence out there, then the, the, the relevant interest group kind of walks into the minister's office and says, if you do this, the sky will fall in. And the minister turns to their public servants and says, you know, like, well, what do you think? And they say, oh, no, no, minister will be fine. And the public's and the, and the vested in interest says, yes, but minister, we're closer to the action. We can tell you the sky is going to fall in. Whereas if there is something that's been published and researched and all the rest of it, then the minister turns to the public service and they say, what do you, what do you think about this? And they say, well, but, but minister, on page 27, it says that the sky will not fall in. And the minister then turns to the vested interest group and says, well, you know, I've got people who've really looked at this hard and they say the sky is not going to fall in. So when you tell me it's falling in, I know that you're just basically pleading your cause. You might be, you're no closer than the people who wrote the, this report. And on the other hand, the people who wrote this report you know, don't have a vested interest. So I'm going to believe them. And so I think that's one of the reasons why evidence can make a really big difference to the success or otherwise of reform. Now, that only works if you've got public opinion on, on side, as we were saying, um, but at least it helps. Indeed. Um, thanks, John. Now, I, I was going to come to you all on vested interests and on states. Um, I'm glad John managed to squeeze some of that in there because we are very, very, very fast running out of time. So I, I want to put one final question to all of you. I'm going to ask you to be very brief, uh, no more than a sentence. Uh, but, but if I came back as the, the policy reform fairy godmother and if I could give you all one wish, so just one thing that you can change, um, whether it's about policy making processes, the, those sort of external forces, the political class themselves, um, that would make policy reform in the national interest more likely. Um, what are you going to choose? Um, start with you, Martian. Treat the community as adults, um, less short termism, more focus on the medium term, and greater honesty and transparency in the discussion. Brilliant. Thank you, Don. Uh, well, I, I think, as I've been saying, we've got to change the motivations of, of political leaders. So I think um, the realisation that um, you too could be a celebrated, successful um, leader and when it's all over, you can go back to your family and re-establish your links and have the children say, you did well. Legacy matters. <laughs> uh, John. Well, I want to change the structural things. I was hoping that the Don was going to wish for all of the um, changes to ministerial advisors and that you were going to grant his wishes and that then, for, therefore, having done that, I could then ask for a whole bunch of wishes around um, uh, improving the capability or, or more importantly, the, the right almost of the public service to contribute directly to public um, policy debate. Um, so those would be my two wishes um, and I'm hoping that maybe Don will take over one of them. <laughs> Everyone's been slightly greedy with their wishes there, but nonetheless, brilliant answers. Um, thank you so much to our fantastic, thoughtful speakers, Martin, Don and John. Um, huge amount of food for thought there. I think we probably could have gone for another hour very easily.
Uh, I know everyone is here on the line because you care about the national interests. Uh, sometimes it does not have many friends in the public discussion, as we've just been talking about. Uh, I can assure you that Grattan will always be one of them. Uh, we are just about to kick off our end of year financial giving campaign. It's the most important time of year for us for raising money. And it's really crucial that, that we do so, so we can continue our work researching and advocating for better public policy. Um, so please consider supporting us if you have the means to do so. Um, B will put a link in the Q&A, but there's also a link in the email that we send after the event. Uh, in the meantime, you know, please keep talking to your friends, your family, your colleagues about why good policy matters. Um, thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day.